Hello everyone and welcome to Hacking and Defending Kubernetes Clusters, we'll do it live. You've got myself, James Cleverly France. I am a security engineer at Control Plane. Uh, I lead our penetration testing services, purple teaming, uh, deliver training and workshops, and facilitate CTF events and scenarios such as the one we run at KubeCon events uh, like this one. All right. Hi, I'm Fabian. I'm a security architect also with Control Plane, and I'm passionate about all things automation and security, um, especially supply chain security in the last year. I um, spoke at Six.con and uh, some community days and meetups in around Berlin, where I'm also located. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, we'll do a high-level overview of what threat modeling is and why it might be important to you. Uh, and then we'll go through uh, six exploit scenarios at pace, uh, look at the, uh, and, and so in, in each of those individual scenarios, uh, we'll have a little bit of a look at the impact of the attack. Uh, and then we will uh, map uh, through to uh, controls that we would use to prevent against some of the techniques that we demonstrate and have a little bit of a discussion about those sort of mitigation strategies. Then at the end, we'll summarize and uh, have a look at what we've learned in the session. All right, as, as James mentioned, um, let's first define the term threat model or the exercise of threat modeling. So what is this? Um, in a threat model session, you should really define and also address the risks of your system, right? Why would you want to do this? Of course, you want to find security issues uh, before someone else does, hopefully before it goes into production. Um, so to prevent this, uh, we want to do this as soon as possible. So if you have a new system, for example, do a threat model session as soon as an architecture is available or even an architecture draft can be used as input here. If you have a system that is to be extended, this is usually done with the means of a user story or something similar. So you can use that piece um, to think about like new risks being introduced into the system and how to mitigate them. So who should join these threat model sessions, right? This is a group exercise, so you should really bring everyone to the table. Your developers, your SREs who know how to run this stuff in production, bring your security folks and everyone with domain knowledge or like spe special knowledge about the system. Uh, everyone can, can bring insights to the table and you find more risks together and you find more appropriate mitigations together as well. Really, this is just a quick overview. If you want to learn more on how to um, do threat modeling, Rowan gave a great talk at a previous KubeCon, so check out his talk for uh, like an in-depth discussion of the topic. <clears throat> So there are great many uh, resources out there to assist you in your threat model session. Um, we will be using today the Microsoft Threat Matrix for Kubernetes. Um, it presents you with a lot of tactics or yeah, entry points an attacker could use to gain access to your system, but it also presents you with the mitigations to take um, to prevent this from ever happening to your cluster. Um, all of our six scenarios are based on this threat matrix and we will reference the same mitigations they do as well. Um, of course, there are more resources out there, specialized, for example, container matrix or the CNCF financial group, for example, worked on a set of attack trees, which are really helpful to think about or get in the mindset of an attacker, because usually it needs more than one vulnerability to really take over your system or access your database, right? So you need to follow a whole path of attacks, and these attack trees like visualize them very nicely. So scenario one will be about discovery and initial access, same steps an attacker would also take. Um, but before we dive into the scenario, um, let me set the stage briefly. So we will run all the scenarios on a Kube ADM based cluster but all the steps will work on any type of Kubernetes distribution, right? So you can run it on a cloud provider managed Kubernetes, such as a GKE, for example, or you can run it on your developer laptop with like micro Kubernetes. And I really encourage you to take the same steps, right? It's very powerful to see how an attack plays out. You can watch your system and see which, which parts are affected. <clears throat> 
right. We've done this before, so it's fine. <laughs> All right, so first, nothing up my sleeve, right? So if we look at our cluster, there's nothing deployed with Helm. Uh, if we look at the namespaces and the pods, we can see, as I said, this is a kube ADM-based cluster. I deployed the Weave uh, Net CNI um, for the networking component. And now I, as an administrator, am tasked to deploy Jupyter Hub. Um, for those who don't know, Jupyter Hub is a application. Yeah, sorry, it's fixed size. The next ones will be better. <laughs> Jupyter Hub is an application to run Python programs in an interactive manner. So it's very popular with like scientists, um, data science, NLP, and so on. So I, as an admin, I just follow the, the docs of Jupyter Hub. I deploy the Helm chart and have it running in no time. So now we step into the shoes of the attacker. Um, attackers continuously monitor all the routable IP addresses of the internet, and they do something called port scanning, right? So you can do this on your own with a tool like Nmap. Um, and here we scan the ports 30K and up. So these are the node ports. And we can see that every external participant in the network can discover the open port 31903. And if we check, this is exactly the port that is advertised or used by the public proxy of the Jupyter deployment. So if we use those same information, the IP and the port, we can go to a web browser, browse there, and because it's a new application or freshly deployed application, default credentials of course work. So Jupyter Hub is a very powerful application and it makes it super easy for both the devs but also attackers to directly launch a terminal from your browser and get execution in the pod. So getting initial access to a system is quite easy, as you can see, with just a few misconfiguration steps. So maybe let's recap briefly. So the admin deployed as per Jupyter Hub the Helm chart. They enabled the node port service because like, let's face it, setting up a load balancer is kind of a pain in the butt. Um, they, of course, didn't change the user and default password and they were asked to deploy a really powerful application with, with lots of permissions. So mitigations for, for this, right? You should restrict your traffic uh, via network segmentation. Kubernetes uses a lot of ports, not just node ports, to basically manage the, the control plane um, or the backend of Kubernetes. Um, and you should really lock those down, only make them accessible to those components or user, users who really need the access. And secondly, as with every application, you should use strong authentication, delete default passwords and users. This is not specific to Kubernetes. And even better, use um, two-factor authentication. If you, for example, use this load balancer, you can do this in a single point and even set up things like um, IP allow lists and so on to yeah, make your system even harder against attacks. So now James will talk about uh, persistence. So once our attacker has that initial, initial access has maybe found a vulnerability or something exposed that shouldn't be, um, they're going to want to look, wanna look uh, uh, to see what they can uh, do and enumerate their environment. So for... Oops. How do I can spell? There we go. How's that size at the back? I know I have no brightness control. I don't know if any of the tech guys can dim the lights maybe at the front. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hopefully that's a bit better. <laughs> so for this scenario, uh, we're, look we're getting our initial access through a leaked secret. 
<laughs> so something by the sound of it that you're familiar with. Um, but this is, in this example, uh, leaked through a Git repository. We can see a Git commit here. Um, this could be in a public GitHub repo, um, maybe even uh, a file in an S3 bucket. I'll leave to your imagination. Uh, but from the context, the attacker can see uh, that the key in the config file is called token, gives us a little bit of a hint. And through previous enumeration, the attacker knows that the, there, this environment has Kubernetes clusters running. So the attacker makes uh, an educated guess. And here we set up the kubectl binary to use uh, the token against the API server of the Kubernetes cluster uh, that we have previously enumerated in, in the environment. So we can see the tokens being used by the CLI arg down here. Uh, we're using the server IP address of the uh, API server that previously enumerated and ignoring uh, the CA certificate for now. So we'll set this up as an alias just to make the next commands a little easier, um, and issue a version command just to check basic connectivity. Uh, and we can see with the server version returned to us, uh, that gives us uh, initial indication that at least our basic connectivity is working. And then we'll go and the attacker will go ahead and will likely enumerate what permissions they have. So I'll have to shrink this down a little bit. Uh, to make sense, hopefully you can still read or get the gist of that at the back. Um, but here we can see uh, the permissions associated with this token, uh, which are largely default. So these top lines are default permissions that are available to tokens for querying uh, what they can do, just as we're doing now. Uh, and these non-resource URLs are default as well, which is kind of just discovery based. What of interest are the pod permissions, uh, deployment permissions, and namespace permissions, which are definitely not default and have been added to this token. So the attacker is then going to use these credentials to start enumerating the cluster, at which point, uh, and start trying to make the most of those privileges. So here the attacker is running a benign command ID uh, in a container, checking the output, just to check that command ran successfully. Uh, and then after that, the attacker may look to create persistence at the Kubernetes level. Um, so here using a slightly different resource type of deployment, which affords them a level of persistence, you could say. Um, just as the workload is more likely to be recreated uh, if for any reason it was killed off. So you can hit, see here the creation of the deployment using our benign ID command. Uh, we'll check that the workload is creating and that the command has run successfully. Uh, and then demonstrate if for whatever reason uh, the pod was killed, uh, it's recreated in the API server, sort of giving us a slightly better chance at persisting in that cluster long term. So what have we witnessed here? Our attacker has found some credential externally, not in our infrastructure, or in a public facing part of our infrastructure, and has managed to execute commands and got a foothold in our infrastructure. So this may allow them to do further enumeration, and maybe exploit other things uh, in our infra. How, how do we mitigate against this? So the first option here is uh, restricting access to the API server on a network level. Uh, at the very least, we can implement uh, an IP allow list, uh, restricting access to that API server. Um, even better would be putting it in a private network that only we had access to. 
Further to that, we can restrict what sort of things attackers are able to run in our clusters uh, through gating images, uh, through uh, a policy framework such as OPA or Coverno, uh, or if we're using private networking, it might just not have external access. And then in, in addition to that, we want to restrict uh, people from running workloads with any additional privileges um, and potentially escalating, uh, escalating their privilege to something that is undesirable. Um, so we can, again, use one of those policy frameworks or something inbuilt like uh, pod security standards to restrict these. So talking of privilege escalation, we're looking at that in a little bit more detail in this next scenario. So in this demo, the attacker has landed in a privileged container. So this is either the attacker has managed to create a privileged container and exec into it, or they landed in one through a vulnerability uh, in, in a workload. And here they're enumerating what's available to them. And the attacker has found that there are unmasked devices in the container and is enumerating through those devices to see what they are. So here the attacker has found that the, one of the devices looks like a primary uh, file system for a VM. And so they're mounting that file system into the container and verifying the contents of the device. And here we can see it looks like a root file system and uh, is a good chance that it will be the uh, host OS. Uh, so at this point, attacker may look to uh, jump directly into the host, which could be achieved in a number of methods, maybe a malicious cron job, backdooring bash RC. But in this instance, we're going to drop a malicious or a key, SSH key under our control into the authorized key file of the root user. From here, the attacker would be able to SSH into the VM host uh, and completely bypass containerization. So what have we seen here? The attacker has started off in that initial foothold and has privilege escalated onto the VM, which may allow them further escalation or access to further resources uh, for abuse. What can we do to prevent some of this, uh, some of these type of attacks? Uh, so, really, there's very uh, only a few limited use cases for use of the privilege container. They should absolutely not be used in day-to-day -day workloads. Um, so, auditing our clusters to make sure we're not using these kind of privileges uh, as much as possible uh, is really important. The re recently introduced. Uh, Pod security standard is an excellent way to prevent these kind of breakouts, um, just because the baseline default prevents a lot of mischief, um, and as it's built directly into Kubernetes, um, is quite easy to use. Uh, I'll hand back to Fabian for the next scenario. All right, thank you, James. So next scenario will be about authorized, or in this case, unauthorized access. So the brightness is not a feature, that's definitely a bug. Um, so in this scenario, we're deploying just a plain old pod into the Kubernetes cluster. As you can see here, there, there's no magic in the spec, right? It's just a container image getting deployed. And we're using a image with kubectl in it to interact with the Kubernetes API. Can exchange this for any other tool that can do network requests like curl or roll your own. <clears throat> so once we have the pod, scheduled to be deployed, we can exec into it. And as we can see, without having any additional things in our pod spec, um, there's a secret 
available in the pod at var run secrets kubernetes io and that's the service um, account so each pod in kubernetes gets the service account to talk to the kubernetes api and as we did in a previous scenario we can now use the can i command to basically list all the permissions we have with that token now we can see it, it gives us a lot of um, permissions to query additional information about the environment. So an attacker could use this to, for example, query all the API resources we have in the cluster. And we can see on the bottom right-hand side, for example, the Tecton, the CRDs for Tecton are available in the cluster. So this would give an attacker an idea to look for further vulnerabilities, look at known vulnerabilities in Tecton, and leverage those to like continue their journey <laughs> through our cluster. <coughs> So same for the API versions, we can also query those. With the token, we are not allowed to query like pods or secrets, not even in the same namespace. So it's somewhat limited, but still has some value to an attacker. Um, so what can we do about this? Um, there's an additional flag in the pod spec we can set, which is called auto mount C uh, service account token, which by default is true. So we get the service account token, or we should definitely set this to false for every pod who does not need to talk to the Kubernetes API. As we can see, when we exit again into the container, there is no more service account for us to use, and therefore we don't have access to these additional information. So other way around, um, now we have an application that actually needs to talk to the Kubernetes API, and instead of using that default service account or extending it, we should really create our own service account so to, to do that, we create the resource of the service account for our machine user. We create a role that is allowed to get and list secrets in the default namespace. And we attach those two resources together with a role binding. And in the pod spec now, we can specify the service account name. And this service account will now be made available inside our pod. Again. We exec into the pod and with kubectl, for example, we can see that we can now query the secret, but we can also list all the other secrets in the namespace, which may or may not have been intended. But we see here that, for example, there is a Docker credential available in the same namespace, which we can now read out. <coughs> so let's recap briefly. So every pod has this default service account, and we should really disable this um, via the shown config field. Um, and we, again, should use least privilege principle. So even when we define custom roles for our services to use, make sure to really lock them down as much as possible. You cannot only list, um, like limit it to the namespace, but you can also limit it to specific resources, the verbs. So pay attention to all those things to only give the required amount of permissions. So next scenario is about poisoned image in the container registry. And for that scenario, <laughs> we do like the GIF a lot more. That's <laughs> nice to see. Uh, in demo five, we will now use the Docker credentials we discovered in the previous scenario um, to attack the container registry of our Kubernetes cluster. So we can see here, for example, we have a deployment in our Kubernetes cluster, which is called Awesome Cats, which is hosting some cat pictures. Seems like the perfect target for me. Um, we can configure the Docker credentials we found in the previous step and use a tool such as Crane, which is very powerful to do like weird operations on container registries. Um, you can, like standard scenario, list at least the versions of, a, of an image. And we can also fetch the digest. So we can see here, there are four versions of this container image available in the registry. And latest is always a nice target for an attacker to see. And we will see in a second why. So we will grab the digest of that latest image, which is like the fingerprint uh, behind that image. And we can use another Docker file to basically now extend the image we have discovered, right? So we start from the image, but then we eject whatever code we want, we hide it as an init, init sh, and we extend the entry point um, to execute our script. 
before like the previous entry point is called again. So we're not raising any suspicion by, by breaking their service. So after building and, and pushing that image, we can refetch the digest and we can see that this has really changed. So this was 8.8 uh, before, now it's 3.ee. And we have a different image behind that latest tag, right? We just overwrote it. So what you could expect is that our code is now running on Kubernetes, but that's not the case. So we can see there is no command executed. This is because Kubernetes is not like watching the tags in the registry. It is only downloading um, the image if necessary. So we as an attacker need to force uh, the pod to get redeployed. Um, usually you find a lot of vulnerabilities for web servers where you just crash them. So the pod dies, gets rescheduled, and the image gets, gets downloaded again. Um, I will simulate this by just scaling down, scaling up, but you can find those uh, malicious payloads easily to crash a lot of web servers. So once the rollout was successful and the pod is rescheduled, we can query uh, the service again. We can see the service works fine. No one is checking or double checking, but we can see that now I'm in your system, our code is executed and we can do whatever we want in the system. All right, so what have we witnessed? We used the leaked container credentials and the lessons learned here is really we need to protect also the external cluster dependencies, right? Usually you have container registries, but also config repositories if you're doing GitOps. We have deployment pipelines and secret managers, and all of these have power over our cluster. They can be abused by an attacker to gain some sort of control um, of what is happening inside our cluster. So specific mitigations for this attack is really to pin by hash. So any kind of, of attack that can be overwritten by an attacker is a nice target. If an attacker adds code to your container image, the hash will change. So now if you pin by hash, the attacker has two problems, right? They need to attack the image, but they also need to attack the deployment file and change the reference in there to get their malicious code deployed, which makes it even harder for them. Going one step further, we can also use container signing. So only deploy images that are signed by us. Um, if we do that, the attacker now also needs to gain access to the private key and sign the image before it can get even scheduled in Kubernetes. And lastly, we should really use short-lived secrets. Um, we heard this a lot, but if the credential for the Docker uh, registry is long-lived, the attacker also controls this attack vector for a very, very long time. If we make those short-lived, the attacker really is, is on the timer to get that attack out there, and maybe we can lock them out before they can get to the next step. All right, scenario six, uh, six is about evasion and James Bull. We'll speak about that. So once we've gone, or the attacker has gone to all this effort to get access to our clusters, maintain their existence there, they may want to avoid being detected by the administrators. So we'll have a look at that in this scenario. So at the Kubernetes level, one thing that we're given is a resource called events, which is the same as any other resource, um, but it is kind of a, a meta resource uh, implemented by Kubernetes to give us information about what's happening in the, uh, in the control plane and in the cluster. So we can see normally this has a whole load of information about what's happening. So for example, uh, we're looking here at uh, a fairly vanilla cluster, but even then there's a lot of information. Uh, we can see information about kube proxy, some control plane components here. Uh, as, as I said, we're in a kube ADM based cluster. Um, there's some Calico stuff here, as that's the CNI we're using. It's a whole lot of information. Um, and if we're, if we're a malicious actor, there'll be some information in here about the workloads that we've been creating and what we've been doing to the cluster, which is potentially undesirable. So what we can do 
is just delete the information. And as shown, it's all gone. Easy as that. So this is a little bit suspicious. I don't know about you, but if, if I came to my cluster tomorrow and saw no events whatsoever, I think something very fishy would have happened. So a, a more skilled adapter, a more skilled attacker, sorry, may go through and selectively delete events. But on the Kubernetes level, this would be a great way to um, start avoiding uh, some detection by our administrative and security teams. So one of the issues here is that this, uh, th this attack is a little distribution dependent. So if you're running in a cloud provider, it's more than likely that your events will be shipped off to the cloud provider's logging solution. Um, so therefore, eventing, uh, deleting event logs in the cluster won't delete them in the uh, logging solution. So it's not quite as useful in that scenario, but it's definitely worth checking because it will depend on the setup. If you're, if you're in a provider that manages the control plane for you, um, they'll have made a decision about how they handle logs. Um, so it's, very, it's dependent on which provider or distribution you use as to what they're doing there, uh, as to how effective this would be. Again, looking, looking at the level of privilege an attacker needs to do this, there's very few scenarios in which a user needs delete event. It should really only be restricted to, to be up, like cluster admin, I'm really struggling to think of any legitimate use cases for this. Um, and so yeah, re reviewing, reviewing these permissions to make sure they're not unnecessarily distributed is key. So looking back at all these scenarios, what have we looked, what, what have we understood today? So hopefully some of these scenarios have helped you understand why some of the best security, best practice exists and what the impact of some of these exploits is. Hopefully you'll be able to take some of the resources we've linked to today away from this session uh, and that'll uh, help you with some of your threat modeling exercises going forward. And hopefully we've communicated some of the importance of threat modeling to you um, to help you contextualize and prioritize some of the risks you or your org may encounter. So we realize this is quite a rapid run through a lot of the topics we've talked about today. Uh, if you have any questions about threat modeling or any of the exploits or scenarios you've run through, please feel free to ask a question uh, or drop by at the end of the session and ask us more. I'd be more than happy to chat about any of it to you. Thank you. As a last slide, we're running, there's a couple of sessions of our threat modeling um, available to those that are interested, where we're running 20 minute sessions. Um, as a company, you're more than welcome if you've got any organizational problems. Um, although there's, I think, a couple left this afternoon. So yeah, come, come and chat afterwards. Also, if you're interested, we have a booth in Hall 5 and jobs available. Thank you.